Good evening if you're in the east coast of the United States where I am and a little further west where our speaker is from. My name is Anne-Marie Murphy and on behalf of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute at Columbia, the Center for Foreign Policy Studies at Seton Hall, the New York Southeast Asia Network and the Apex Study Center, it's my pleasure to invite you to this or welcome you to this webinar on Singapore's foreign policy towards the United States. This evening's talk is part of an eight week conference series called Southeast Asia Views America, Perceptions, Policies and Prospects, which aims to assess the tenor of bilateral relations between the United States and Southeast Asia at the start of the Biden administration. President Biden has declared that the United States is back and in contrast to his predecessors unilateral and transactional American first foreign policy, he has sought to assure Southeast Asians of the United States commitment to multilateralism and renewed engagement with allies and partners. At the same time, however, strategic competition with China is a defining feature of Biden's foreign policy. And this has led many Southeast Asian analysts and policymakers to fear that the new administration will view Southeast Asia largely through the lens of Sino-US rivalry and pressure them to choose sides. The conference series, therefore, features prominent Southeast Asian experts to provide a regional perspective on how the, uh, their country views the opportunity and challenges to enhance bilateral relations at this time. And to help us understand Singapore's views of the United States, we're extremely fortunate to have one of the country's leading experts on the topic, Dr. Say Sen Tang. Dr. Say Sen Tang is president and CEO of International Students Inc., a faith-based nonprofit in the United States, and concurrently professor of international relations at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at the Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. Dr. Tang is a prolific author whose latest books include The Responsibility to Protect in Southeast Asia, The Legal Authority of ASEAN, and the European Union's Security Relationships with Asian Partners. And to provide commentary on Dr. Tang's presentation, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Amy Seawright. Dr. Seawright is a Senior Associate for Asia at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, where she previously served as senior advisor and director of the Southeast Asia program. Dr. Seawright brings a wealth of experience on Asia policy, spanning defense, diplomacy, and development. Recently, she served in the Department of Defense as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia from 2014 to 2006. And prior to that appointment, she also worked uh, in USAID. So we have two experts and we are going to have a very stimulating discussion tonight. The way we're gonna proceed is that Dr. Tang will make his presentation and then Dr. Seawright will make her commentary and then we'll go to Q&A. The Q&A is open, so please put your questions uh, in the box. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for, for having me on, on this series, uh, a very, very important uh, topic uh, for a time such as this in particular. Um, well, the title of my paper um, is, is uh, that goes something like this, Helping America Regain Its Mojo, which is something that I hastily threw together uh, with an abstract uh, because uh, uh, that was what was expected of me. And I, I kind of sent that off to Anne-Marie without really thinking too much of the, the gratuitous conceit <laughs> in implying that a small country like Singapore can help uh, the world's leading global power. And for that, I feel that I, I should apologize <laughs> to one and all, but uh, uh, it's, it's a bold title, uh, but a very timid paper that essentially uh, reiterates a longstanding common argument, namely that Singapore regards the United States as the indispensable power whose, whose global might, uh, global purpose and reach has in at least in the post-war period, has been and continues to be viewed by the Singaporeans as essential to the stability, security, the peace, and the prosperity of, of Asia. And in that respect, Singapore therefore seeks to assist America, particularly post-Trump America, recover this dimension and function, its foreign policy towards Asia, 
And indeed, one could argue that from the Cold War to the present, or at least since the British withdrew east of Suez in the early 1970s, that Singapore's policy toward the United States has been to proactively welcome, to facilitate, and particularly today in the face of increasing Chinese objection to US strategic dominance in the region to justify America's place and role in Asia. As Singapore's Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Lung, uh, declared back in 2007, I think it is, during a visit to Washington, DC, and I quote, America still plays a role which nobody else can play, holding the ring and fostering the stability of the region, enabling other countries to grow and prosper in a stable environment, unquote. So it's, it's fair to say that this view has been tested, was tested when President Trump uh, came to power and recused America from its traditional role in global leadership and particularly by Mr. Trump's hardline approach toward China, all of which proved rather challenging, shall we say, for Singapore, uh, who would much prefer that America hew to its traditional role and presumably the Singaporeans through quiet diplomacy and, at, and perhaps at risk of coming across to the Americans as being too pro-China, uh, having said as much to the Trump administration. But I should say in fairness to Trump, uh, it wasn't the first time that Singapore's policy preferences created friction between the two countries, despite their very, very robust partnership. Uh, think back for instance to 1989, when the Sino-US ties were rocked by the Tiananmen Square massacre. And like much of the world at that point in time, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, who was then in his final year as prime minister of Singapore, Lee and his fellow leaders were in fact appalled by the Chinese Communist Party's actions in Beijing. Uh, nonetheless, rather than join the international chorus condemning the Chinese, Singapore, well, at least according to how retired Singaporean diplomats would like to tell the story, uh, reportedly chose instead to initiate the very controversial Asian values debate, ostensibly to take the heat off the Chinese, if you will, and to buy time for the US-China relationship to get back on an even keel, rather than, as some people may have observed, because Singapore, illiberal Singapore, supported the Chinese crackdown. And coming back to the, to, to the present or the, or the near, uh, the near recent, uh, despite its discomfort with President Trump's rhetoric and policy, Singapore stayed the course of its pragmatic encouragement and facilitation of America's forward presence in Asia. And as such, coming to the gist of, of, of this series and the, and, the, and the key question here, my sense is that the transition from Trump to Biden will not change things fundamentally so far as Singapore's policy toward the US goes, more like it's back to business as usual. That being said, Singapore's view of America's so-called indispensability has not meant and does not mean a commitment to take Washington's side on every international issue and or international dispute, though I should also say, and I think there's some fair amount of agreement on this, that, there, that there's been a a, a, a fair bit of congruence in, in that respect in terms of the partnership between Singapore and the US nonetheless. But if, as we are wont to say that the devil is in the details, uh, then the nuances in Singapore's perspective and position, particularly concerning relations with China vis-a-vis -vis that of the US, uh, have at times generated discomfort and friction between Singapore and the US, but clearly nothing of the sort that has led to any impairment of, of bilateral ties, more like little hiccups, if you will, uh, in what has largely been a robust relationship. And I do in my paper highlight a couple of so-called problematic areas uh, that may or may not have arose between the Singaporeans and the Americans. So with that kind of a long introduction out of the way, let me sort of summarize the paper, which is divided into four sections, if you will. 
The first section discusses Singapore's propensity to hedge, uh, as uh, strategists would like to, to call it, and states that hedge, at least to my mind, typically don't behave in an even fashion vis-a-vis -vis other powers, other states. They don't necessarily sit on the fence, not, not always, at least sometimes they do, nor do they stay rooted in one spot vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Essentially, uh, the hedging strategy that's been practiced and exercised by Singapore is one that is, I think, informed by a general preference for America as the region's strategic guarantor and that's only because I think Singaporeans believe that, as I, as I argue in the paper, that no other power at this point, including China, is either fit or ready to take up that responsibility. The second section of the paper, which I entitled Facilitating American Engagement, rehearses a well-known and oft-mentioned narrative of how Singapore, as a so-called, as the terms of reference have it, the major security cooperation partner of the United States has largely supported and serviced America's engagement with the Asia Pacific region from the immediate post-Cold War period to the present and arguably doing a better job at it perhaps than some of the US traditional allies. The third section of the paper, which I may have unfairly entitled managing American petulance uh, details Singapore's challenges as it sought to work with an administration that seemingly opposed all that Singapore believes was necessary for a stable, secure, and peaceful Asia, such as, for one thing, continued provision for the region's security through US-led alliances and security partnerships. Secondly, a support for globalization for trade liberalization and the rules-based international order. Um, and thirdly, uh, active engagement in Asia and participation in ASEAN-led multilateral fora and regional architecture and so on and so forth. Now, some of these things that I've said are obviously unfair uh, to the Trump administration, uh, which I think has, has, has largely tried its level best to, 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 to play by, by, by the so-called um, uh, rules of the road, uh, but that being said, I think all the, the other kinds of things, the rhetoric uh, and some, some of the decisions that were made uh, clearly uh, rocked the boat as far as the Singaporean perspective uh, were concerned. Uh, you may remember in his first day in office, President Trump withdrew the United States from the Trans-Pacific Trans Partnership uh, in which Singapore was heavily invested as a founding member of the Trans-Pacific Strategic economic partnership, the so-called P4, the precursor to the TPP. Um, but that being said, although Mr. Trump criticized US-Asian alliances, particularly Japan, uh, you know, was, was, was um, the, the, in, his, in his target uh, as, as being unfair um, because they haven't been contributing enough to uh, the relationship, uh, at least as far as Mr. Trump were concerned. And yet Trump arguably wasn't as critical of the Asian alliances as he was of the European allies. Even so, uh, Secretaries Mattis and Tillerson, both Asia hands, I think both worked very hard at walking back the president's claims. Uh, and so the section of, this, of, this, of the paper, uh, this section briefly discusses the impact of Washington's stra strategic rivalry with, with Beijing and of the US-China trade war on the region and, and particularly on Singapore, as well as the travails of a small state uh, living in the, in the very, very long shadow cast by China across Asia, where Beijing's proprietary interests and sense of ownership loom very, very large. And where the line between what Singapore can do and what it must suffer to borrow from the million dialogue has alarmingly thinned uh, in recent years. But despite its own challenges with China, Singapore, like most other Asian countries, I would say, uh, probably did not support the Trump administration's hardline policy on China as, as expressed, say, particularly in the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy.
Uh, the Singaporeans did not publicly reject the FOIP. They just basically avoided talking about it, uh, focusing instead, as we shall see, on urging mutual restraint uh, and seeking opportunities for cooperation between the two major powers. This leads to the paper's fourth and final section entitled Urging American Restraint, which speculates on how Singapore would, would likely engage the Biden-led uh, America uh, based on the signals stemming from comments, uh, statements made by Singapore leaders and some of its leading foreign policy spokespeople, including uh, the Prime Minister himself, Prime Minister Lee, uh, his predecessor, Go Chok Tong, uh, the irreverent but eminently quotable Bilahari Kausikan, uh, and of course the evergreen Tommy Ko. Uh, incidentally, Tommy recently tossed a Zeus-like bolt at me requesting that I contribute a chapter for his latest edited book, to which I replied, but of course, without quite even asking what it was he wanted me to write about because no one in Singapore says no to Tommy Ko. So. But crucially, I think the gist of Singapore's signal or messaging uh, that it wants to convey to uh, the Biden administration, at least as, as far as I understand it, is, is, is this. That Singapore welcomes President Biden's vow to restore U.S. alliances uh, of the support for multilateralism, of international cooperation, but Singapore also understands the need for the U.S. to get tough with China, as Mr. Biden uh, is, is known to, uh, for putting it. So against this backdrop, the Singaporeans' message to the Americans, but not just the Americans, also to the Chinese, I think, has three parts or three pleas, if you will. Firstly, acknowledging the likely persistence of the US-China rivalry, Singapore nonetheless urges that both sides find common cause and seize opportunities to collaborate. And Singapore is fully cognizant of the differences in values and interests between both sides, which were, as we saw in full display at the Alaska Bilateral last March, or for that matter, even the first phone call uh, between the two presidents back in February. But Singapore believes uh, in the art of the possible, as my prime minister uh, noted, it is the great power's capacity for cooperation that is the true test of statecraft. Uh, the second aspect of the message would be this, that Singapore calls for America to share power with China and for China to accept America's rightful place and role in Asia. Power sharing was a point Prime Minister Li made in his 2019 Shangri-La Dialogue keynote, which reportedly, as I understand it, upset some US officials upon hearing what he had to say. Uh, indeed, uh, it is also something that President Xi uh, mentioned as well in his Boao Forum speech this past April a comment that was clearly directed at the Biden administration. And as I suggested in my paper, uh, Singapore's vision of power sharing between the two big guys differs conceptually from what some of the Australians have, have said, particularly Hugh White's uh, concept of power's notion, which really doesn't appeal to the Singaporeans because that likely means the relegation uh, perhaps of ASEAN or smaller countries like Singapore to the margins of regional affairs and decision-making. Moreover, uh, Singapore has also long insisted to the Chinese that the US historically has legitimate interests in Asia and that Washington plays a strategic role that no other country can. And China should therefore accept that reality as such. And here I, I recall as a PhD student a long, long time ago, interviewing Ambassador Xi Junlai, longtime leader of China CSCAP, the track to process for my dissertation. And I pointedly asked Ambassador Xi whether China accepts, and I use that terminology, the reality of the US as a residential power in Asia. Now, Ambassador Xi is a very eloquent man but he can be pretty gruff at times as well. And so he cuts me off in mid-sentence 
and replies very bluntly, China does not accept the US presence. Then he sort of dramatically pauses and he smiles rather sweetly at me and he says, but we tolerate it. Today, I think the observation that China has finally ditched Deng Xiaoping's dictum of hiding your strength, biding your time, all that, all that has become de rigueur. But I think back to Ambassador Xi's comment so many years ago, and I wonder if even toleration today is even possible. But it has to, if cooperation or even grudging respect is to be possible at all between these two major powers. Third and finally, uh, the message includes this, uh, that Singapore sees itself serving as a voice of reason, if not of conscience, in urging America and China toward mutual strategic restraint. For the Singaporean leaders who, for better or for worse, like to pride themselves as rationalists, uh, the US-China rivalry has obviously seen its fair share of foreign policy driven and motivated by passion and emotion rather than prudence on both sides where mutually reinforcing aggressive rhetoric and actions have dialed up tensions, obviously. But I think America's own storied legacy in international leadership has also involved, quite crucially, the prudential exercise of strategic restraint and moderation. You know, neoliberal institutionalists have clearly understood this. I think of John Eikenberry's book, After Victory, on US global leadership after World War II, and as well as, as balance of power theorists, folks like Enos Claude, or in the regional context in Asia, on the Asia Pacific, the late Michael Liefer as well. And so Singapore, I think, seeks to remind those who would listen of the importance of mutual restraint and moderation to the maintenance of regional order and stability. Now the Singaporeans are under no illusions about their ability to affect or to shape the regional strategic situation and to affect uh, regional outcomes by their efforts. Indeed, one could argue that helping the United States, helping, again, I wanna be careful, helping the United States uh, regain its footing and credibility in Asia post-Trump and working to try to sway the US-China rivalry away from purely zero-sum perspectives and calculations, all of that could prove to be a poison chalice or a fool's errand, as Bilahari Kausikan once put it. Why? Because such a mission provides no sweet spot on which Singapore can conceivably land. And in the end, Singapore could well end up our, uh, angering both the Americans and the Chinese. But I think there's no question regarding Singapore's commitment to its self-appointed mission. Um, as you know, today, a second wave of COVID infections has led to the cancellations of the 2021 Davos World Economic Forum meeting, which was supposed to be held in Singapore. The Shangri-La dialogue has also been called off now. And much as Singaporeans like to take pride in their ability to host such events as indications of Singapore's so-called convening power or presumed relevance to the international community, I think a big part of it also has to do with Singapore's desire to furnish opportunities for the Americans and the Chinese to engage one another in multiple settings and hopefully establish that modus vivendi that will take their relationship and and needless to say, the region as a whole toward a more peaceful and stable direction. That's the hope. Well, uh, I wait with bated breath to see what the reality might, might well be. So, so thank you, appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for that uh, extremely interesting perspective. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dr. Seawright. Amy, the, the screen is yours. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you for inviting me uh, to join this seminar. And thank you, um, Dr. Tang, for inviting me to comment on your paper. I really enjoyed reading it, and I've enjoyed uh, being a student of your work um, all these years. Um, 
uh, it was a really interesting paper. It was terrific uh, to read it. It, it lays out um, Singapore's uh, strategy, the constancy of Singapore's strategic perspective when it comes to the United States and China uh, uh, in, and, and, and the role of the United States in the region. And the fundamental pre premise of the paper, as, as you just uh, discussed, is that Singapore is um, uh, uh, a hedger, a preeminent hedger among many hedgers in the region, in a region of hedgers. Um, um, uh, uh, but Singapore's hedging strategy, um, uh, in many ways, Singapore is the most adept. In, in your words, I think it's one of the most crass, perhaps the most crass hedger uh, in Southeast Asia. But this hedging strategy is deeply rooted in um, Singapore's geopolitical position and its uh, historical legacy and its diplomatic and political uh, culture. Um, so uh, because of this kind of strategic, um, kind of bedrock strategic perspective, um, Singapore's uh, has been very constant over the post-war period. And it's uh, it was able to pretty seamlessly um, uh, deal with the transition to the somewhat disruptive disruption of the Trump era, um, and then go from the Trump era now to the Biden era. Um, and this, so th these transitions um, from Obama to Trump and now Trump to Biden, you know, we won't see that much change in Singapore's policies. It won't change that much. Um, nor will or has China's rise changed Singapore's strategy all that much. Um, first, let me just you know note that uh, Singapore. It's interesting to think about Singapore's hedging in comparative perspective. There's some interesting variations among the hedging, um, the hedgers of Southeast Asia. Uh, so many of the countries in the region do hedge. Uh, when we we think about some of the real hedgers in the region, Malaysia, um, even our treaty allies, Thailand and the Philippines, um, in recent years especially, have been hedging quite a bit. Um, Vietnam, even Indonesia. I mean, all of these countries uh, hedge quite a bit between, you know, the United States and China, um, but they hedge in different ways. Um, they hedge um, uh, and engage with uh, the two strategic rivals, the United States and China, through different channels. They have very different styles of hedging, um, but all of them are seeking to avoid overt alignments um, and overt balancing in order to maintain some autonomy, some strategic autonomy um, and maneuverability. Um, but as you point out, um, Dr. Tang, they are not, hedging is not the same thing as fence sitting or neutrality. Um, it is, it's, it's an active uh, strategy to, to maintain strategic autonomy. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's about choosing partnerships um, in different spheres, in different areas, different arrangements in the economic or security sphere um, that, that are in their own interests. So arguably one reason why we see so much hedging, um, why we see this phenomenon in, in Southeast Asia is because the two great powers allow this to happen. They don't force alignments um, in the way that we might see, perhaps it's harder to be a hedger in, uh, in, in Russia's sphere of influence, for example. Um, uh, but and yet we do see that China increasingly makes some demands on states that sound like if, if, if they're not demands about alignment, they certainly are seem to be demands um, uh, to maintain neutrality. So, for example, just the other day, we heard about China making a demand on Bangladesh, saying if, if you were to engage in any activity with the Quad, that would, you know, mean that we would take that as, uh, 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 they would have grave consequences for Bangladesh's relations with China. So that is, you know, these are kind of demands that we hear China make. So, you know, perhaps we are moving, and there's always this concern that we hear out of the region, um, certainly within Southeast Asia, uh, that, they, you know, these countries do not want to be forced to choose. Um, but so, so far, the United States has, you know, allowed these countries to hedge. Have, have, they have not been pressured. Uh, they have been allowed not to choose. Um, but that doesn't mean that U.S. policymakers and intelligence officials don't um, think quite a bit about Southeast Asia's um, alignment choices and their hedging strategies. And they're, you know, they are quite interested and concerned about alignment choices that they might make down the line. Um, but in terms of China's sometimes coercive pressures in the midst of its rise, 
um, it was the Singaporean foreign minister, after all, who bore the brunt of the Chinese foreign minister's stare back in the uh, ARF meeting um, in uh, Hanoi when uh, Yang Jiechir said, you know, China is, uh, uh, China is, uh, is a large country and other countries are small countries and that's just a fact. Um, and it, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly the case that um, these countries sense China's rise, sense some course of power. And so choosing not to choose as these hedgers do does not necessarily mean that they don't have preferences. And we saw in the 2021 um, uh, ICS poll of, of Southeast Asians, many people have talked about the Yushak uh, Institute poll, uh, that uh, the question that, that caught many people's attention, you know, was if forced to choose, if ASEAN were forced to choose between the strategic rivals, uh, which country would they choose? And nearly two thirds said the United States. 61.5% said if ASEAN were forced to choose, they would choose the United States versus 38.5% choosing China. And that was up quite a bit from 2020 where 53.6% said the United States versus 46.4% uh, choosing China. So these, th the sense that many countries in the region want to have balanced relationships, want to be, you know, have um, lots of relationships with lots of different players does not necessarily mean they don't have preferences. Um, these are not, uh, th they're, they're, these are not empty um, uh, preferences. There are, there are real substantive things going on here and real growing concerns that are very clear in the ICS polls over time, as well as other polls that were taken. CSIS did a poll last year that showed very similar trends. Pew polls show similar trends. There is certainly growing anxiety, growing concern about, chi about China, China's role in the region. There's a growing trust deficit with China in the region. Um, we can see a Biden bump, <laughs> you know, some, con some concern about Trump the, uh, the United States under Trump that is now flipping back to uh, optimism about the United States. It won't be automatic. It won't be, you know, there's no ground to automatically make up overnight, but um, there are clear preferences for United States leadership in the region is, is one point to make. And we also have seen Singapore is somewhat, maybe not an outlier, but Singapore is remarkable in a sense that it has been very constant in terms of really being very consistent of being very much kind of in the middle um, of, of, of not sort of aligning too much one way or the other versus we have seen some movement in the hedging strategies of some countries in the region. When we look at Vietnam, uh, when we look at India, we look at Australia, I mean, these countries, Japan, you know, over the last um, several years, they have moved quite remarkably towards a more open if not embrace a more, you know, more open acknowledgement that they have strategic alignments um, of varying degrees with the United States. Um, whereas before they were much more careful to be in the much more clear, you know, hedging camp. And then we've seen some in the other direction as well. You know, the Philippines, Thailand, arguably sort of moved in the opposite direction. Um, so, um, one question I think would be interesting to, to think about is this, this hedging strategy that Singapore has, has been very constant, but we also see some very interesting changes in Singapore's domestic politics uh, with the rise of the fourth generation. Some perhaps declining predictability in Singapore's politics on the horizon. So are there potentially, one question I, I would be interested to ask is, you know, um, are there potentially some um, political factors that might begin to change some of these underlying strategic drivers, um, whether it's the internal politics in the PAP, um, some demographic uh, changes, um, et cetera. Um, but going back to you know the, the, the main point that Singapore has this bedrock strategic continuity, you know it means that this abrupt shift to America first policies of the Trump uh, era were handled in a very even keel way. And now, which the paper outlines very nicely. And now the shift from Trump to Bi Biden, we've 
even this this whiplash um, as a return to normalcy uh, in diplomatic terms to alliances and partnerships and multilateral cooperation, the focus on ASEAN and showing up to ASEAN, um, this kinder, gentler American foreign policy has been welcomed by Singapore and Singapore stands by ready to uh, again provide um, uh, 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 justification of America's role um, and offering advice to, to the United States. Um, um, but, and Singapore is hoping that this kinder and gentler policy will extend to uh, Biden's policy towards China as well. Um, before turning to Biden's China policy, um, I do want to make a point uh, about, about one thing. I think that Biden's foreign policy overall is a return to real sort of the establishment foreign policy in many ways. So, you know, the bipartisan consensus that has underlined American foreign policy, um, you know, in the post-war era, uh, you know, has returned this, you know, this understanding of the importance of alliances and partnerships, the international institutions. Um, the, there's, you know, the, this, these are real strategic drivers of the way that Singapore's grand strategy of hedging is is really driven by strategic drivers. This, this is this is this, you know this is what underlines America's strategy in in these areas. And the Trump era was a little bit of a of a, of you know even though the, the United States has long traditions of of um, unilateralism and isolationism that that taps into it was a little bit of a detour into that what otherwise was a more consistent, um, you know, a, strateg a strategic driver uh, shaped kind of a foreign policy. And we're sort of back to that. But the one area where we're not back to is on trade. Um, the bipartisan consensus, um, the strategic drivers of American foreign policy still lies in a free trade orientation. Uh, and all the strategists understand, especially with, with the emphasis on an Indo-Pacific priority in American foreign policy that, you know, free trade or a trade uh, pillar to a strategy has to be, um, in, you know, is integral to, to, a, to a real strategy. And so a trade component is necessary. Everyone understands that. Um, but trade right now in the political realm is messed up. And even, so from the top down, from the, from the strategic element, you know, we should have a trade strategy, a kind of free tra trade strategy. And from the bottom up, we should, because public opinion polls actually show that American, you know, the American public is actually relatively pro-free trade. And certainly the Democratic Party, the political base overall is relatively pro-free trade. And young people are, coastal people are. So from the bottom up, we should be able to have a, a free trade <laughs> policy. It's the middle, it's the political parties that are messed up on free trade right now. Trump messed up the Republican Party and the Democrats have had these, you know, historical uh, uh, kind of leg have 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 historical issues with free trade. And so it's really and, and Trump has really kind of, you know, poisoned the well in terms of discussions around trade. So it's very so it, it seems sort of impossible right now to imagine a free trade uh, policy in terms of partisan politics, but I, so it'll take a while to shake that out perhaps, but I don't think in the long run, it's impossible to imagine the United States getting back to a free trade policy. Um, but so right now that's kind of missing, but um, overall we're kind of back to more of a strategic orientation to foreign policy, but that doesn't rule out the idea that, you know, um, domestic politics will rear up again in another election and we'll get back to another disruption of what, sh what are the more strategic drivers of American foreign policy. But this brings us to China. So, you know, in your paper, there's a clear sort of Singaporean hope expressed that, um, that Biden will soften the tougher edges, the, the rougher parts of, of Trump's um, get tough on China policy. Um, I, my perspective is that, um, that what we're going to see is, um, very much you get tough on China policy, but um, it's going to be, there are going to be some differences. Basically, I think that there, there, there has been a growing consensus on the need for a real tough minded strategic competitive approach to China that emerged before Trump. It, it emerged back in the Obama administration across many, many sectors from defense to, you know, commercial and economic and technology and cyber and the informational space. 
um, you know, and now adding in, you know, what happened with COVID pandemic and, and a lot of a lot of areas, kind of um, experts and policymakers and analysts and sort of all of these different fields have really kind of merged in many ways to a view that China's strategic ambitions and its tactics, its behavior, you know, have led many people to think that it, that we really do need a new approach, that there's, you know, the old, as you say in your paper, the sort of old tactics haven't, the old engagement approach hasn't worked and, um, and new, a real new approach needs, needs to be taken. So I don't see this as a Trump get tough policy. Um, and I think Biden is coming in with a team that experienced some of the battle days, some of the old kind of mistaken approaches as they see it, and have seen some of the slipshod ways that the, some of the things that Trump did that were effective and some of the slipshod ways that the Trump team never really managed to get all of their different um, strategies in order. And they're coming in with de a determination to make a really clear policy process so that they have a really clear coherent strategy where all the different streams are coordinated and therefore effective. So all the, you know, all, I think what we're going to see is a very deliberate approach that's going to, you know, tie up. I mean, you know, it's going to coordinate the defense and the and the economic and the development and the cyber and the supply chain and you know, sort of all across the board. And it will be uh, an attempt to be much more coherent and strategic, but not soft. <coughs> So um, I don't think you're going to see a softer approach. It might sound a little more rational, um, a little less bombastic, but I think it's going to be more coherent and therefore actually tougher. Um, uh, so um, so I so that, that's what I see coming. Uh, that's what I see forming. Um, now this does not preclude cooperation, but I think what I think what um, I think where the really interesting uh, uh, discussion is going to be is is what what do you mean by cooperation? Um, because when, when I was in the Obama administration, we talked a lot about cooperation with China. We were very concerned about, about the perception that the United States um, was not cooperating with China. So at the time, we were interested in trying to find, you know, little low-hanging fruit of things we could do with China to cooperate so we could show the region that we were cooperating with China. And there was some value in that. But I think we're kind of past that now. I think now, uh, um, although it's, there's not there are easy things to do. There's nothing wrong with doing that kind of thing. But I think um, now, I think the bigger question is, are you, you know, is the, are you talking about doing cooperation for the sake of sh doing cooperation? Or is it genuinely trying to find areas where there's mutual interests and doing cooperation in those areas? And I think it's very important to distinguish between the two areas, and especially when dealing with China. Um, you don't want to get stuck in the trap of trying to, uh, you know, convince the Chinese to cooperate with you on areas where it's in Chinese interest to cooperate. <coughs> because China is really a master in, of playing the game of creating false choices. Um, and I think I'm actually quoting Bill Ahari Kosakon in saying that. But, you know, in saying, like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, 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 of China telling you that, uh, you know, you must not do X or else we cannot do Y with you. Well, if it's your, in your interest to do Y with us, what does X have to do with it? It's, you can't allow China to sort of link, do horizontal linkage with issues that are separable. And so, first of all, you know, if you want to cooperate on climate change and you and you can find a deal on climate change, that's great. You cannot say, well, we can't confront China on human rights because then they won't give us a deal on climate change. That kind of linkage just is is a real problem. And but but I agree with you. We we need to be creative. We need to look in areas where some people might think we don't have common interests, where in fact we may have common interests. And here I throw an issue at Singapore. Take an issue like Myanmar. You know, a lot of people think Myanmar is an area where we have strategic competition with China. I think Myanmar is an area where we, it's, we all have so much to lose with Myanmar. Singapore certainly has a lot to lose. ASEAN has a lot to lose. And the United States and China and India and Japan and Australia, we all have a lot to lose with, with Myanmar because Myanmar is heading in a catastrophic direction that's gonna be a failed state in the heart of the Indo-Pacific. 
and just playing some game of patience and, you know, tolerating the generals for a while and hoping that things kind of eventually turn back to semi-normal, I think is a very terrible strategy. And I think Singapore and ASEAN should right now be working as if hair is on fire. And they and, and China knows this too. China does not want an outcome where, where Myanmar is a total failed state. And they don't know what to do. It's clear that China does not know what to do right now. So ASEAN should be working to convene the United States and China and India and Japan and whoever else to try to come up with some kind of a process to get, you know, some kind of outcome that's better than where we're headed uh, with the junta. Um, and I think I think we could probably get some cooperation out of China. And China has a lot more leverage than certainly the United States does. Um, um, so, you know, that's an area I think we could be very creative. Um, but we would need, we, the United States, would need Singapore and ASEAN to really help get China to the table, I think, on that. Um, uh, so that, you know, these, I think there's some really creative, interesting areas where we could be thinking about those kinds of things. But what, it, you know, the idea, what, when I hear people talk about cooperation with China, I, it always seems to me like there's this expectation that if the United States just goes to China and says, hey, let's cooperate, that we're going to come up with some great deal from China. In my experience, when we go to China and say, hey, let's cooperate, we just get sort of blank stares. And I was in a discussion um, re relatively recently with some um, people from a development bank who were kind of really frustrated saying, why can't the United States just cooperate with China on vaccines? You know, you have patents and China could be manufacturing vaccines and we could be distributing it to the world. And someone from the United States government said, um, well, you know, we've had discussions with China and we've asked them what they would like to do to cooperate with us and they don't get, they don't indicate that there's anything they want to do with us. <laughs> so the idea that like that China would want to do so, China is, it doesn't often come up with ideas themselves of things they want to cooperate with the United States on. So I would just say, you know, it's not necessarily the case that it's on that the, that it's the, it's the, the United States is the lack of of uh, of generation of cooperative ideas. I think in fact the Chinese system is much more of a blockage. To, to doing a lot of you know, cooperation. Um, and if there are areas of mutual interest, I don't think you're gonna find much resistance in the, in the United States system. Again, with the caveat that I do think we have to be very careful not to allow you know, ideas of cooperation to get in the way of areas where we do need to be very clear-minded and, and, and compete, uh, compete or, or confront um, and not allow China to kind of you know, link everything together. Um, I think I've talked too long, so um, let me just look quickly to see if there's any um, notes. I think the final thing I wanted to, to do is just ask a, a question um, with, if I can find my, my last note, page of notes. Oh, the other, the other question I'd really love to ask um, to Dr. Tan or, or to anyone in the audience, I guess, is um, what is meant by power sharing. I, I, I'm often very curious when I hear this idea from Hugh White or anybody, um, when, when, it's, when it's sort of suggested that the United States should consider power sharing with China, I really have a hard time understanding what is actually being asked um, and how it would be in Singapore or any, any, any country in the region's interest. For, the, for example, how how, how, what would, what would be, what would power sharing look like in the South China Sea? Would it be the United States saying, you're right, China, we're doing too many freedom of navigation operations in your territorial water, in, in, in waters that you claim is yours in the South China Sea. So we'll let you, we'll let you claim that we won't challenge it anymore. You know, despite the fact that other claimants have, like, we'll, we'll just, we won't, we won't, we won't challenge your excessive claims anymore. I mean, I don't quite understand what power, you know, in my, I guess I, maybe I'm just, I'm too in my own American bubble. I don't see the United States claiming power, you know, we, in, in, in Southeast Asia, we kind of show up to meetings that ASEAN convenes and we stand up for norms and principles and we join, you know, agreements. I wish we had joined TPP. We walked away from it, but those are the kinds of agreements I, I wish we joined. Um, help negotiate and join. 
Um, but I don't, you know, I mean, China is the one that's making these excessive claims on things like the South China Sea and 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 other things. Um, so I, I don't know what what power we're supposed to be uh, giving up exactly. Um, so I, it would it would help me a lot. I, I don't. I, I Hugh White and others just confuse me when they talk about. You, Hugh White is talking about things like Taiwan, like we should, you know, um, like give up our claims to defend Taiwan and stuff. And I, I, but I don't, I don't see how that's in anyone's interest really, but I'll, I'll stop there. I had other questions to ask about mutual, but I'll, 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 I'll stop there, Anne Marie. Well, thank you very much, Amy. That was extremely comprehensive. And uh, it's always fascinating to get the Singaporean view and then the American view. Um, so, Seng, you got um, a lot of food for thought there. Um, I don't know exactly where you want to begin to cut in on this. Uh, you know, Amy mentioned the clear preference for U.S. leadership. You mentioned that uh, with Singapore as well. I think, I think the fascinating thing with for for an American is that Singapore is so vocal about it. Um, in contrast to others who might state it in a anonymous survey, but don't come out the way uh, publicly by government leaders or, or thought leaders. So I let you comment on that. There were questions that I thought were fascinating about the uh, potential change in domestic politics. Obviously, the PAP won 61% at the next last election. Um, your deputy prime minister uh, is stepping down. So will we see a change either, as Amy asked, within the PPP, or is there a generational change? Um, you can ask whether you think it's going to be tougher with Biden. You know, many people argue that Southeast Asians you know, it was easy to ignore U.S. entreaties under Trump um, that with a rational, polite, traditional foreign policy under a new administration, that will be tougher. Um, and then the power sharing uh, question is huge. So I'll let you uh, jump in on where you would like to at this point. Okay, well, thank you, Anne Marie, and thank you, Amy. That that was that was fabulous. I, I really appreciate the the very thoughtful um, um, uh, responses that you gave, comments that you gave. Uh, lots lots of, of great food for thought, and 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 I'm just going to take many of them as they are, and 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 rework my paper accordingly. I think it's, it's fabulous. Uh, but let me just just try my my level best to uh, react to some of the the issues that you, you touched on, and, and they're more, more so, I think, agree, in agreement with, with what you have said, uh, rather than uh, uh, any, any uh, uh, sort of a, a rebuttal of, 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 of sorts. So uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, you know, hedging does not at all preclude preferences. And I think uh, that was the point I was trying to make in my paper, where, where indeed, um, uh, uh, as, as I tried to say, hedging is not about you know, constantly, incessantly sitting on the fence. It's, it's about deep engagement, oftentimes, with as many folks as possible um, and in, in all directions, uh, uh, conceivably. And it's not just the Chinese and the Americans, but also with the Japanese and the Indians and so on and so forth. So I think that has been a policy uh, that Singapore has, has hewed to uh, for the longest time. Obviously, uh, the United States and China are um, uh, central to that in, uh, only because they are the biggest kids on the block, really. And, and, and so I think that, that has been very, very obvious. But uh, back to your point, your excellent point, uh, uh, and, and I tried to, to demonstrate that in my paper, uh, Singapore is, is, is the preference, I think it's obvious, right? The United States uh, has proven itself uh, as, uh, a, a, a great power that holds the ring, that contributes to the stability, long-term stability, peace and prosperity of the region. Yeah, there were a couple of things, hiccups along the way, like the Vietnam War, et cetera, and all those kinds of stuff. But really at the end of the day, the US is, I, I think it's, 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 it's fair to say, it's, it's the preferred option, if you will, in terms of, of, of uh, strategic guarantor 
uh, of the region and, and what have you. Um, I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's very, very safe to say that, the, that as far as the Singaporean perspective is concerned, uh, the Chinese are not quite there yet. Um, uh, whether in terms of uh, China's own expressed capacity to be a strategic guarantor, um, and, and I think the Chinese themselves, yeah, you, you hear ambiguous messaging, right, from the Chinese, but I think many of them have, have, have made it very clear that uh, they, they, they are not ready to take over by any stretch of the imagination uh, and to play the role as the Americans did or have, are, are still doing. Uh, so I think that, that is very obvious. And I, I think uh, it's, it's clear where Singapore's options uh, are uh, and preferences are uh, in, with, that, with that regard. Um, your question about leadership transition in Singapore is, is crucial. Uh, uh, clearly, the, 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 there's been all kinds of questions about uh, the character, the nature of the fourth generation, so-called what we in Singapore refer to as a fourth generation uh, leadership in the People's Action Party. Um, and, and now given, yes, as, as Anne-Marie has noted, right, the, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister recently stepping down, again, big questions about about where, where is Singapore headed in, in that regard, particularly in terms of its leadership. Uh, I, my, my sense is that things will, will continue as they are, uh, in part because I think a lot has already been invested uh, in, the, ex, in, in the, the, the new leadership. Uh, so it's not as if we are gonna get a whole new crew of leaders that, we, that, that, that have no experience whatsoever. Uh, I think in, in quite a fair bit could be said about um, the way the, the, the Singapore leadership has responded to uh, present day challenges like the pandemic. And so these things are, are, are seen and articulated in Singapore, uh, at least uh, to my mind, as opportunities for, for um, the new leadership to demonstrate uh, that they are able uh, to, to, to lead. Uh, it's, it's our 9-11, as it were, uh, uh, so to speak. So, so I think in that regard, despite uh, the, um, the obvious um, uh, abrupt and uh, you know, uh, disappointment uh, with regards to, to the, the Deputy Prime Minister's decision to step down, I think uh, the, 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 the so-called four guys that have been identified as the potential uh, to, to take the top spot uh, are, are folks that are by and large, I think, proven in that regard, again, in, in the way that I've, I've framed it. Uh, so I, I don't think there's going to be any major surprises in terms of Singapore's relationship with the United States uh, in that regard. So it's going to be uh, more, more of the same, I think, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is one way to put it. Uh, China obviously has been putting tremendous pressure on, on, on Singapore. Um, all the kinds of things like influence operations that, that you, Amy, have written about vis-a-vis -vis Australia, uh, that's, that's been Singapore's experience as well. Uh, but that being said, I think as far as the impact on Singaporean society were concerned, my sense, and, 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 and I, I have to admit I may be off base here, but it, it would seem to me that uh, there is even as we talk about leadership transition and new generations of leadership taking over in Singapore, that cultural ties that Singaporeans have with China are, are, are lessening as, in, in some respects uh, as we go through generations. My, my parents' generation, that's a whole different ball game, right? You know, um, and my, my, my dad, uh, uh, he's not on this call, so I can say it, right? You know, he's a bit of a sinophile, I think. But I think um, uh, each succeeding generation, I think the, 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 the degrees of separation from the Chinese, I think that has really been, been critical in terms of, redu of, 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 of lengthening, if you will, that distance, um, that cultural affinity between Singapore and in China, so I think that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean, therefore, a, a, a swing, you know, to to the to, to the U.S. necessarily, uh, but uh, but I think uh, it, it just uh, what I'm trying to suggest is I, I I don't think that those ties with with the cultural ties that people like to talk about because Singapore is is a, is a is a Chinese majority uh, a city state that 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 those connectivities with with China are therefore going to be strengthened, but I, I think it's going to go the other direction, um, uh, in fact. Uh, but um, 
Uh, but yeah, the, the the leadership issue is something that that we in Singapore are monitoring and and, and watching with bated breath as well. Uh, but my sense is that it's not going to sway Singapore uh, overtly away from from its current robust relationship with the United States. Uh, that's that's my two cents worth. I think on on that. Um, I, I completely concur with you, um, Amy, on, on, on the question of economics as essentially the, the standout, right, in terms of, of uh, the Biden administration's broader policy of wanting to um, um, walk back from uh, Trump administration's very hardline approach to China. Uh, but economics, I think, is the standout here. And I think uh, um, President Biden has made it very clear and is obviously very clear as well the, the bipartisan nature of uh, the, the, the what, what shall I call it, the animus, if you will, you know, that, you, that we, feel, we can feel uh, uh, in, in America today with respect to the Chinese on trade and, and other kinds of issues. So I, I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, it's not going to be back to some kind of a, you know, U.S.-China state of nature type situation is not going to revert back to to the old days as if the old days were something very very peaceful and I think that's not the case. But I think Sing the Singaporeans understand this new normal. I think they really do um, because we, while it may not be trade with us, you know, but I think all of the other things as I've, as I've described, right, you know, influence operations. Uh, very, very difficult relationship with China because of Singapore's position on things like Taiwan and, 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 and on um, the, 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 the rules-based order, um, on, on the, the UN arbitral tribunal's decision vis-a-vis uh, -vis China's so-called claims on the South China Sea. And all of that has really placed Singapore in a very, very difficult position vis-a-vis China. So I think Singapore is, is, is very, very, uh, we're walking into this eyes wide open uh, and, and, and fully cognizant of the challenges and difficulties. So I think this new normal of, of, of the US-China relationship under Mr. Biden uh, is, is something that Singapore uh, understands and indeed even I, I would say accept um, and uh, because, because I, I think there, there is some sense that, hey, you know, I think th there needs to be a little bit of pushback against China uh, with regards to this. Uh, so I, I, I think, I think that's, that is understood and accepted, uh, but that's not to say, as you have also rightly put it, you know, that there will not be cooperation uh, despite this kind of a situation. So I think Singapore's messaging, as I've tried to demonstrate in the paper, is essentially an attempt to uh, remind not just American friends, but to remind the Chinese as well, that in the midst of this kind of a situation that rationality has got to have some place and role in, 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 this, in this relationship. And, and that, that uh, uh, prudence and, and rationality dictates that, that we, we ought to seek opportunities for cooperation. Your, your point about the, the, the Chinese um, perspective on cooperation is fascinating. And, and I've, I've heard versions of it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, having been part of um, you know, 1.5 delegations uh, on the Singapore side with the Chinese, I've, I've in a sense uh, tasted <laughs> what you have just described uh, with regards to the Chinese perspective and position on cooperation. So, so I, I'm fully aware of that, um, but, uh, but I think, uh, uh, that's not to say that that the, the both sides cannot still uh, do their level best in, in, in seeking for cooperation. So I think I think that's that's the kind of difficult position that Singapore finds itself in today. Uh, you know, acknowledging the new normal, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, conveying this message of we need to find cooperation. You know, in spite of all these circumstances, uh, that's a message that that. Um, um, is is gonna, you know, is is gonna is is difficult finding an audience, but it still needs to be said. So I think from the perspective of a third country looking in uh, and invested on both sides of the equation as well, uh, I think that's the uh, 
uh, you know, an understandable message that, that uh, Singapore would wish to convey, again, not just to American friends, but to Chinese friends uh, as well. Um, your, your observations on, on Myanmar, I thought were just spot on. You know, I, I cannot agree with you more that Singapore and ASEAN uh, could, do, could, could, could try a little harder um, on this. And, and I, I've, I've written a couple of op-eds to, 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 to that effect as well. Um, and, and I think your point about uh, the potential for Singapore and ASEAN to um, convene, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, meetings between uh, American and Chinese friends in, in working in, in, in India and Japan and in, in Australia, what have you, to to work on Myanmar, I think is something that 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 seriously needs to be considered. And it, it's it's definitely a message that I would want to bring back uh, with with your permission, Amy, to to friends uh, uh, on the Singapore side if they so choose to listen <laughs> at all. So, and I think they will. Um, um, power sharing. Wow. Okay, great, great, great question. Um, um, and, and, and here I, I, I must confess, you know, uh, that I, you know, you know have the, the, the academic hubris and conceit right, of, of, of thinking, oh yeah, you know, power sharing means equal opportunity, means, uh, you know, having equal say in terms of the creation of, of the rules of the road, uh, not just to be a, a rule taker, but to be a rule maker, da, da, da. All that conceptually easy to say, but what does it mean in terms of the actual empirical uh, realities? And, and I think your, your point is, 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 is very well taken here. Uh, I, I, I mean, the Chinese keep insisting, right, that, uh, hey, you know, uh, uh, let us have a say in the mutual crafting of, of, of the rules of the road, whatever, whatever the heck that means, right, the norms, the principles, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I guess it, it really goes back to that sense that the, our, our Chinese friends have had, you know, the hundred years of humiliation, et cetera, and what have you, you know, but I think just, just wanting to be recognized as being, uh, you know, have, having a seat at the table. And I, I, do, I do take your point that, that, that yes, they, they, they have been at the table, they are at the table, but they're not playing the game. Uh, so I think your point's well taken. Um, uh, what, what will it take for, for, for um, um, uh, uh, an accommodation, a proper mutual accommodation of both sides, uh, which is something that I've, I've tried to, to allude to in my paper, uh, that's, that's how, how that's gonna, where, where the rubber meets the road as it were, how's that gonna play out in terms of, of the actual interaction between uh, the two great powers, uh, that's, that's the $64 million question. And I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, uh, I'll leave it to the practitioners. <laughs> so, but thank you. This was a, I really appreciate the, 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 tr the great observations. And, and so thank you so much. And thank you very much, Sang, for your uh, very thoughtful responses. I want to remind the audience that the Q&A uh, box is open if you have any questions. And if not, that means I get to ask more. So um, that's fine. I, I wanted to follow up um, a little bit on ASEAN, right? Um, saying clearly uh, in your paper, you talk about how Trump abandoned, you know, the multilateralism of the Obama administration's rebalance and ASEAN was critical to that. Everybody expected the US to re-engage ASEAN except now we have the Myanmar crisis. And beyond the crisis itself is the impact on ASEAN as a form through which the Biden administration can engage the rest of the region, right? We all remember in the 1990s and early 2000s when the US and Europe and other dialogue partners would not meet with ASEAN at various meetings if the Myanmar um, delegations were there. So I guess part of my question to you is, from the Singapore's perspective, how critical is ASEAN to engaging the United States? Obviously, Singapore, DOD, and others 
you know, you have these very tight strategic partnerships, forms for communication. A, so how important is it? And B, do you believe that the current Myanmar crisis poses an existential threat to ASEAN, which many Southeast Asian um, interlocutors have argued? Um, and then the third point, which gets at your notion that, you know, Southeast Asia has to cooperate, but also resist, right? Both the US and China when they contravene national interests. And as you repeatedly state in your paper, national interests is key for Singapore. Um, you've had somebody like Bilahari say that Laos and Cambodia are acting as agents of China, that they have lost their autonomy, they are not pursuing their own interests, and they should be kicked out of ASEAN. Yes, he is eminently quotable, as you noted earlier. So could you kind of give us your sense of how Singapore views ASEAN, the crisis it faces, and um, whether or not Singapore is worried about the Biden administration not showing up? Those are great questions, great observations. Um, I think I think the sense that Singapore has is is that uh, ASEAN is is of critical importance uh, in terms of uh, its role as a as a as an institutional platform as such, by which the region as a whole could engage the major powers. Um, and so, in that regard, despite the fact that Singapore clearly has a very robust bilateral uh, relationship and has the supporting frameworks to service that that relationship, um, but ASEAN still plays nonetheless a very critical role uh, in in allowing the region, all ten members of ASEAN, to engage not just the United States but China and, and everyone else. So, so I think um, in that sense, the it, it allows for uh, the the Again, I, hesitate, I was going to say collective, but I, I just kind of took a step back because it's very difficult to use that word in Southeast Asian context. But uh, regional perspectives, if you will, um, to be to be articulated, uh, and 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 so I think in that sense, um, uh, ASEAN is 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 never going to be second, uh, just merely secondary to to other things. It's 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 a it's an important platform uh, unto itself, and so I think. Uh, Singapore would clearly um, welcome um, American engagement with the region as a whole through uh, the ASEAN framework, um, because that's that's been, uh, I think, uh, it's, there's a longstanding history uh, to that, um, and and clearly it's it's one that's been appreciated also by American friends, uh, and so I think. Um, uh, the Biden administration's uh, very positive comments. I think of Secretary Blinken's comments uh, uh, that that uh, that his president intends to engage ASEAN uh, substantively. So I, I I think that is something that is a message that has been very welcomed by the region as a whole, and 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 we look forward to 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 seeing that uh, materialize um, in the in the days to come. Um, does Myanmar? Uh, pose an existential threat to ASEAN? Great question. Um, I think I can just count, and I don't have enough fingers on my hands to count the number of times that that question has been asked over the years. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's not just Myanmar, there's been so many other instances, and and every time, you know, people would ask the question, you know, is ASEAN going to die? <laughs> uh, I, I think ASEAN is a very crisis-driven institution and by that i mean uh you know it comes to life <laughs> when there's when there's a crisis and and so in that sense while it's coming to life with regards to this current myanmar crisis may not satisfy everyone uh, you know but i think it's galvanized it has provided a little bit of a galvanizing effect on 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 asean um and uh 
you know, my, my sense, my sense is that it's it's not like in, in the days of yore, as it were, right? Because I think today ASEAN can look back, as both ASEAN and Myanmar can look back to positive experiences, right? I think back to the two hundred eight um, Nargis cyclone crisis, um, and and of course you may remember even a year before that, um, you know, with with the the Saffron Revolution mm -hmm. and the crackdown on, on, the, on, on the, the clergy, that ASEAN was very forthright in terms of, of its articulation of a position that, that came very close to condemning uh, the, uh, the then junta that was in power. So, um, and, and yes, my then foreign minister took the charge uh, at mm -hmm. New York uh, as well. Uh, yes. in, in, so, so I think I think uh, uh, and then you and then you got you had Nargis, and and the, and the post, uh, you know, uh, reconstruction effort uh, and, and all of that. So I think uh, ASEAN looks back at that experience, and says, you know what, we have done it in the past, you know, in in being able to engage with a very, you know, with, with this group of, of of very tough generals, and and I think. Uh, uh, the, the, so the, 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 the precedent is there. I think the challenge for ASEAN today is, is because of the partial democratization that's taken place in, in, in Myanmar, uh, you know, with the NLD, with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, of course, you know, uh, yeah, you know, the, the treatment of, of the Rohingya uh, has, has, has led to all kinds of questions. Uh, on, on that front as well. But I think it seems to me if, if there were something that's been in a sense unfortunate, it's, it's, it's the, the fact that ASEAN has been dealing with the NLD government to the point that the military, the Tatmadaw may have been left out of the equation as it were. And so I think the, the rush therefore to reestablish connections uh, and channels with the Tatmadaw uh, has really been 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 critical in, in in trying to find a way forward uh, in terms of, of the current crisis, and, I, and my, my sense is that that hasn't really been done well enough. Um, so that's been a, a rather unfortunate thing. So all, all that to say, I, I do not think it poses an existential threat to ASEAN. ASEAN has been around for fifty plus years. Uh, I, I think it's going to do uh, just fine. Um, but um, but I think in order to demonstrate uh, and, and to fulfill and realize some of, some of ASEAN's own self-expressed aspirations toward regional community. Uh, a, a more robust response, I think, to, to, to the current crisis certainly needs, needs to be had. Uh, and I, I take Amy's point that, that perhaps this is the, this, well, this definitely is the opportunity to get more, uh, you know, um, uh, engaged um, partners involved in in, in this, um, my sense is, is is I think it's already being done, uh, you know, behind closed doors. Um, but uh, uh, again, you know, we 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 again wait with with bated breath to see uh, how how this is going to progress and and, and evolve, uh, hopefully in, in more positive ways downstream. Um, the, uh, you, you had another question about uh, Southeast Asia's response to and reactions to the, the, the big powers, particularly when their perceived national interests are at stake. Um, well, I, I think uh, Singapore, and, and, and I may be shot for saying this, right? You know, but, but Singapore's always found itself, increasingly found itself in a difficult spot because Singapore definitely wants to see um, not just greater stability and security in the region, but I think Singapore aspires for the region to move in a much more positive direction in terms of greater democratization. Dare I say that? I just said it. Yes, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it is. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, when, when one were to look at, for example, Singapore's behavior and conduct in terms of wanting to see uh, a, a more robust ASEAN charter, for example. Mm. And I think Singapore is very much, uh, 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 I, think, I think hand in glove with our Indonesian friends and wanting to see uh, 
a much more stronger charter, but we but was but they were held back only because, you know, there were more conservative countries that 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 were concerned about increased scrutiny and, and intervention, etc. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that Singapore uh, wants to push the boundaries on on this, but it cannot do it in a way that 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 upsets. Uh, its neighbors to the extent that you know the region becomes destabilized. So I think that's something that Singapore, this tension, is something that Singapore uh, feels very very strongly, um, and and you hear that in in comments like like the one that Bilahari made, um, and I've also heard um, you know private comments made to the effect, uh, not just involving Cambodia or Laos or whatever, but others as well. Uh, but I think all that. And you know this, all these observations are made after these guys retire. So, uh, so I, I think Singapore still adheres to at least the, the public expression and, and, and belief that ASEAN needs to be united. ASEAN needs to be uh, coher act coherently. Uh, but that being said, I, th I think there are um, efforts as well, you know, uh, and, and perhaps you know, there one even pushed the point that what about the ASEAN minus X principle uh, in terms of security cooperation? It's worked tremendously well in the on the economic front, but mm -hmm. what about applications of ASEAN minus X um, on a security front, uh, be it on the South China Sea, be it on Myanmar and a whole slew of, 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 of very, very critical uh, issues. Um, it's, it's being talked about, I think, at ASEAN circles, within ASEAN circles, uh, but uh, I, think, I think everyone moves very, very slowly and, 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 uh, and, and carefully, uh, you know, because uh, my sense is that, uh, you know, not everyone agrees, obviously, to this, uh, but, uh, but I, I think um, uh, given that there are um, expressions already, um, um, no, no, nobody, no, nobody blares, right? No, you know, with trumpets sounding, ASEAN minus X. Nobody does that, right? But I think you you, you do see, you know, anti-piracy cooperation involving three or four member states, right? You do see um, um, the the ASEAN uh, uh, counterterrorism treaty was signed on the basis of 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 ratification by six member countries, not all ten. So you already see expressions on the ground of, of a kind of an ASEAN minus X at work. Uh, so uh, so I, th I think the ground is ripe and open to the possibility of, of ASEAN member countries, sub-ASEAN cooperation, uh, uh, you know, potentially being pursued uh, and exercised uh, on a variety of things. Uh, but, uh, um, but I think they're treading carefully <laughs> on, on, on these things. So, so uh, yeah, so again, it's a, it's a wait and see kind of a situation. Okay, well, um, we are just about out of time. I had a big question for you saying about the US and the response to the pandemic. I mean, your key point was that Singapore traditionally viewed the US as the key provider of public goods, that the pandemic was Singapore's 9-11. Most of the commentary, uh, particularly under the Trump administration was that the US was not there at all, right? Withdrawing from the WTO chaotic response at home. But now we have vaccines. There was a commitment at the Quad. Clearly, that went away with India's crisis. Mm -hmm. But the Biden administration has lifted the patents, and it is, you know, providing vaccines. So I guess my, you know, one-minute question is. Many others would say China has already kind of won the game if we look at public opinions of which country has shown up and played that role of provider of public goods with PPE, et cetera. Um, do you believe that that is necessarily the case or as time goes on, will we perhaps see a change in those attitudes? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I, I, I don't think for a moment that the game has ended. 
Uh, we may be in the second quarter now, you know, but I, I think there's still more quarters to come. Uh, there's a second wave of, of, of COVID infections happening right now in Southeast Asia, even as we speak, right? Um, you, you mentioned India, but but even in Southeast Asia itself, it's, it's, it's been hit pretty, pretty, pretty hard. So, so I think I think uh, what the Biden administration uh, uh, has done and is doing is definitely something that Singapore would see as, there you go, that's U.S. leadership. Now we're talking, you know. So I I, I think this is going to be very much welcomed, and my sense is the game's not over yet. Uh, this is America's time to rise up and show what it's capable of, uh, the, the leader that it has been all these years. And it's, it's gonna, I, I think it's going to be, a, uh, the region's going to welcome that tremendously and embrace that. All right. Well, that was a big question, and he did get the 60-second answer in. Um, so I guess that means we have to have you back, you know, in six months or a year when we're in the third inning and uh, see how things have panned out. Um, I want to thank all of you in the audience for joining us tonight. I have found this an extremely intellectually rigorous and fascinating discussion. Um, I want to thank Srinith who is behind the scene making this all happen. I want to just let everybody know that our last um, conference in this series is actually tomorrow morning at nine o'clock when we will actually turn to a discussion of Myanmar. Um, our speaker will be Mo Thuzar, who heads up the uh, Myanmar Studies Program at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. Murray Hebert from CSIS will be here as a discussant. The registration link is in the chat. And last but not least, I need to thank our two excellent speakers, Say Se Say Tang and Amy, who really read the paper and provided excellent comments. Thank you both so much. Um, and I look forward to the time when we can do this all in person and keep the conversation going after dinner. Thank you all very, very much.